trees got plenty of room, plenty of sunlight, plenty of good quail food, plenty of good brood cover. The quail uh, are not the most mobile animals. They, they're, they're small. Uh, they don't fly great distances. They can fly very fast, but not for very far. And, and most of their movement is on the ground. And they, they need to have all of their habitat needs uh, met within a small area. Harvesting, prescribed burning are probably the two most impactful things that you can do to a piece of property to enhance it for a suite of wildlife species, not only game species that a lot of our hunters are interested in, wild turkeys and bobwhite quail and white-tailed deer, but also a whole range of other species, grassland songbirds, Henslow sparrows, Bogman sparrows, uh, tree cavity nesting birds, red cockaded woodpeckers, pileated woodpeckers, some things that, that a lot of folks don't think about. And there really are some misconceptions out there about the use of active forest management to, to create good wildlife habitat. But some folks have a hard time distinguishing between what's a destructive wildfire and what's a beneficial fire. The fire has just passed through, and you see that it's browned up the lower needles. You can see green needles there. The bud is perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. My name is Gary Berger. I'm the statewide forester with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. This property has been owned by the state of South Carolina since 1941, but prior to that, it was a uh, southern shooting plantation, quail hunting preserve of sorts, gun club. If it wasn't for people wanting to hunt these birds and enjoy the sport of quail hunting and watching the dogs work and being out in the woods, uh, you probably wouldn't have a lot of this habitat. Good for pollinators as well, which is a, a big issue these days. See all the bees buzzing around. It's burning and thinning, that's, uh, that's the key. This was just burned two weeks ago. What we got here was an accomplishment of our objectives to kill some of this understory of young pine. There's a history behind bobwhite quail and, and the hunting heritage that we have with quail. Years ago, quail was not managed. It was just a function of the habitat, the farming community. The dad could take a son or a daughter out of the back door and walk hedgerows and fence rows and find quail. And today, we don't have that because the landscape has changed. I am Steve Chapman, and I am the forestry coordinator for the National Bobwhite Conservation Initiative. My mission is to work with forest landowners, state, federal, private, non-government organizations that have timberland and manage that to help them in promoting their habitats for, for quail management and other associated species. Um, my name is April Atkinson. I'm a natural resources technician, and I work at the Webb Wildlife Center. The Civil War is really what changed a lot of the land use practices. You had previous plantation owners. You had freed black men and whites who had to have a way of life. A lot of sharecropping started and tenant farming. That was really the best thing that happened to quail. Um, it was dirty farming, it was brushy. Quail thrived in this type of habitat. The farming and the quail worked together. Your locals would hunt quail. They would hunt it with a gun and a dog and go out. They're no different than a baseball player or a football player. They are they're athletes. All these dogs, they want to come out here and do this. They love to do it just as much as we do. She is pointing, and that is our cue that they have found the birds. We're going into the quail's living room. It's, as we're riding through, we see a constant diversity. So here's your partridge pea here. Here's your ragweed plant here. Very lush and green, and it so this time of year draws insects. There's a quail right there. That is the bobwhite quail. That is the male. I'm Stuart Atkinson, the manager of Groton Plantation. Groton Plantation was uh, once a cotton plantation. It's because you've got to imagine the, the quail here on the ground, when they, when they bring their brood out, and they're walking through, bugging through, I've got all these open, these open areas. I want a, a, a closed canopy so that they can be underneath, and you're, so it's a um, lot harder for the predators to, uh, to pick them off. A pretty standard example of a fourth row pine plantation thinning here, where the operator is actually selecting to remove every fourth row. 
but in terms of wildlife management, it's one of the best things that we can actually do is to remove poor trees, thin the forest canopy so light gets down to the forest floor, and then use our other tools as such as mechanical methods, uh, herbicide methods, prescribed burning to manage that understory layer, which is really the more important layer for a lot of the wildlife species. Sometimes just prescribed burning may not be enough, so we need to use chemical or mechanical means. The disking in the fields is a little bit different, and just that soil disturbance triggers germination of beneficial natural plants. We have to have the science and the research to basically prove that what we're trying to accomplish is actually where we're going with all this stuff, particularly with private landowners. To have an aesthetic, pleasing, open forest stand that now has a whole suite of wildlife species in it that you can see and hear and, and interact with, that, that's very gratifying. You need people who are passionate about wildlife, habitat, to actually save this type of ecosystems, manage it provide areas like this for the public.